So hi everyone, I'm Hamas. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Iowa. And today I'll be talking about my work, uh, making sense of constellations, methodologies for understanding Starling scheduling algorithms. So this work would not have been possible without my amazing collaborators, Mike from Google X, Rati from Cornell, and Tony from Purdue, and my PhD advisor, Rishabh. So uh, for this talk, I'll first go over uh, what Starlink is, how it works, and eventually jump into the research question that we're kind of trying to answer. So Starlink is a low Earth orbit satellite constellation and which is used to provide uh, broadband internet. So low Earth orbit uh, satellite constellation essentially means that all of the satellites in the in orbit are less than uh, 2000 kilometers uh, away from the Earth. But in, in the case of Starlink, they're at about 550 kilometers away from the Earth. And the current Starlink constellation uh, consists of more than 5,000 satellites, but in its full and final form, it will have somewhere around uh, 12,000. So, and this is the constellation the Starlink uses to kind of provide uh, broadband internet uh, to all of its users. So now uh, I'll discuss the three main components in addition to the Starlink satellites that uh, Starlink uses to provide uh, internet to its users. So the first one is a user terminal. So this is the piece of hardware that uh, that gets uh, shipped to uh, shipped to you when you first order Starlink. Uh, so what it contains is uh, a bunch of phased array antennas, uh, which are installed at a user's location. And what it does is what these antennas do is that they track satellites and then uh, they eventually talk to them. Uh, then we have ground stations, which are essentially just bigger versions of these uh, user terminals, which are installed on ground by Starlink themselves. And what they do is that uh, they have wide connections to point of presences of Starlink as well and it passes all of the user traffic uh, from the ground station to the pop over wide connections. And then point of presences are just physical network inf interfaces where user traffic is passed uh, to the internet backbone. And then from the internet backbone, all this traffic kind of goes to the end server. So essentially your traffic leaves the user terminal, goes to the satellite, from there it goes to the ground station, from, where, from there over a wide connection it goes to the pop, then to the end server. And then on the way back, it takes the same route. So end server to pop to ground station, to satellite and then to the user terminal. So uh, now I'll talk about uh, some of the positional par parameters which are uh, quite important in identifying where a satellite is in orbit. So the first one is called the angle of elevation. And this is simply uh, uh, the angle between the horizon and the line of sight to the satellite. So essentially, if I'm looking at the chandelier over here and my horizon is the horizontal line from me uh, right in front of me, so the angle uh, which is between this line of sight and the horizon is essentially the angle of elevation. So it tells me how high up in the sky the satellite is, but it doesn't tell me anything about uh, the direction. Uh, so for direction, we use something called azimuth. So it measures the clockwise angle between north and the line of sight uh, to the satellite itself. So essentially, if I use these two parameters together, I can figure out exactly where in orbit a satellite is. However, for a, satellite, for a user terminal to be able to connect to a satellite, uh, the satellite must be at least uh, 25 degrees above the horizon. So essentially, its angle of elevation must be greater than or equal to 25 degrees. And that's the condition that is kind of set uh, by Starlink. So uh, the main question that we're trying to answer uh, in this work is that uh, at any point in time, there is a bunch of satellites which uh, satisfy this constraint. So essentially, a lot of satellites are available which are above the angle of elevation of 25 degrees. So what we wanted to know is that uh, although uh, although there are many satellites available, uh, the user terminal can only connect to and talk to just one of these satellites. So we are going to understand all the factors that go into uh, the decision making process of choosing this one satellite out of all uh, of out of all the ones that are available. However, uh, Starlink doesn't provide us that with that information. So we actually don't know what satellite we're connected to. So in this talk, I'll go over a method that we kind of a novel technique that we develop to identify the current satellite we connected to, and then go over the factors which influence uh, this decision making process. So to do that, our experiment consists of uh, four geographically distributed user terminals, so three in the US and one in Europe. And what we do is that we conduct high fidelity uh, round trip measurements using a tool called IRTT. So we send uh, a UDB packet every 20 milliseconds. And then to control for uh, ground latency, which is this, uh, which is uh, the fiber link from the pop to the end server, uh, which can introduce a lot of noise from uh, the regular internet, we wanted to make sure that uh, that doesn't affect our measurements. So what we do is that we co-locate uh, all of our measurement servers with Starlink's pops. Uh, 
So when, when we started doing these measurements, what we saw was that uh, the latency plots of uh, the latency plots that we got were quite uh, striking. So there is a bunch of patterns that emerge, which we would not expect to emerge from a regular, regular uh, LAN internet. So essentially, this plot shows the round trip times in milliseconds on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. So one thing that we observe is that, uh, and one other important thing is that each uh, dotted gray line on the plot is 15 seconds apart. So essentially, what we observed was that uh, within each of these 15 second slots, uh, the round trip times kind of exhibited similar behavior, but from one 15 second slot to the next, it changes. And what we observed was that uh, over all of our four geographically distributed locations, these changes happened at the exact same time. So it was 12, 27, 42, and 57 seconds after the minute. So this gave us some evidence of a global scheduler that Starlink uses to kind of remap user terminals to the satellite that they were connected to every 15 seconds. And yeah. And we also observed the formation of parallel bands within each 15 second slots. However, uh, I won't be talking about these in detail, but we have a bunch of stuff about it in the paper. So coming back to the same question. So we know that we can only be connected to one satellite out of the on average 40 that were available at any point in time. We still do not know the identity of the satellite that we connected to. So what we do is that uh, to identify the current satellite that we connected to, we take something called a two line element set file. So these are publicly available snapshots of satellites in their orbit. And we use something called uh, propagation algorithms to kind of uh, propagate the satellite uh, throughout its orbit. So essentially you have a snapshot and then you give it to this algorithm and then you can figure out the position of the satellite at any point in time. And lastly, we use something called Starlink obstruction images. So these are 2D images uh, which show the trajectories of satellites the user terminal connects to during, uh, during the uptime. So essentially what we do is that uh, we take, we extract the positions of all the satellites that are currently in our view during a 15 second slot. So essentially S1 through S4, and we get the positions at uh, each of the each of the seconds and within within each 15 seconds slot. Then uh, we take the Starlink obstruction images. So we take them 15 seconds apart. So essentially what we're trying to do is we want the trajectory of a satellite that we connected to during a 15 second slot. So although these obstruction images uh, tell us the trajectory of the satellite, we still don't know the, the identity of it. And another important point is that these obstruction images get overwritten. So to extract, uh, to, to isolate the trajectory of the satellite we were connected to, for example, for uh, time one, we have to take an X orbit between uh, time one and time two to extract the trajectory of the satellite which is connected to us. So once we isolate this trajectory, we then uh, use some math to kind of extract its positions. There's a lot of details in the paper about it, but I won't be going it uh, over it in the talk. So essentially we extract these positions and then what we do is that we compare it to all the satellite positions that we were that we were able to get through the uh, two line element set file. And essentially we compare them one by one and the one with the lowest uh, dynamic time warp distance is the one that we identify as the current connected satellite. So now that we have the satellites that we have, that we are connected to during any given 15 second slot, we wanted to see what factors influence uh, Starlink's global scheduling decisions. So for this work, we only looked at uh, the publicly available data. So stuff like satellite positions, their launch dates, and their sunlit status. So in this talk, I'll just I'll be just I'll just be talking about satellite positions and uh, its sunlit status. So these plots show uh, the above plot shows the angle of elevations of satellites that were available in the dotted lines and that were selected in the solid lines and the azimuths on the bottom in the in the same in the same manner. So essentially, just to make the point. Uh, what we see is that uh, for an angle of elevation of 45 or below, uh, around 80% of all available satellites uh, had this angle of elevation. So the majority were available uh, from this region of the sky. However, uh, only 25% of the satellites were selected from this region. And we see a similar case in azimuths. So if we only consider the middle two quadrants, which show uh, the area of the sky, which is towards the south of the dish, we see that all the 40% of all satellites were available from this region, uh, the global scheduler only ended up picking about 10% of these satellites. Uh, 
So essentially what it shows is that the global scheduler has a strong preference for satellites which are uh, higher up in the sky and towards the north. And just to give a small explanation for it, uh, this allows more efficient communication due to lower power loss. So we go into more details in the paper, but this is essentially what it boils down to. Next, we look at uh, whether a satellite being sunlit affects uh, the preferences of the global scheduler. So essentially throughout a satellite's orbit, there will be times when it's behind the Earth. So it's so the uh, solar panels on the satellites cannot be charged. So essentially we want to see uh, if those satellites do end up being selected by the global scheduler. So in this plot, we kind of, so for the slots where uh, the sunlit and the dark satellites were available in equal proportions, we saw that uh, Starlink overwhelmingly just uses sunlit satellites. But in this plot, what I'm, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we compared the angle of elevations of the sunlit uh, of the satellites that were sunlit that were picked versus the angle of elevations of the satellites that were picked that were dark. So essentially, we see that 40% uh, of satellites that were picked had, on average, an angle of elevation uh, below 50, but that number is only 8% for dark satellites. So essentially, when the Starlink, when Starlink's global scheduler is forced to pick a dark satellite, it picks it from a higher uh, region in the sky, which makes then again uh, the communication with the satellite more efficient. So uh, we basically, now that we know something about these global schedulers, what we wanted to do was to see if we can train a machine learning model to kind of predict some uh, some of the decision making process that goes into these global scheduler decisions. So what we do is that uh, we do something we call batch aware modeling. So we divide each phase in our measurement period into uh, 15 second slots. And for each satellite that is available, we extract the following parameters. So it's azimuth, it's angle of elevation, it's age, and it's sunlit status. Then given a satellite S available at time T for location L, uh, the satellite, the current satellite uh, within the set has uh, the parameters, so azimuth, angle of elevation, age, and its sunlit status. And what we do is that we place them in clusters. And this is how we form these clusters. So essentially, uh, each parameter uh, goes, uh, the value for each uh, point in the cluster is essentially the amount of standard deviations away this parameter is from the group mean of this parameter uh, for that 15 second slot. So essentially, we're binning these satellites by, by how far away from the standard deviation of each of these parameters they are. And these are the features that we kind of put into our machine learning model. So essentially, count of satellites within each cluster and the local time of when this, these observations were made. And then we train a random forest model and we get the top gear accuracy of, uh, of the model that we built. So what we see is that uh, our model performs higher than the baseline. So the baseline in this case is just the clusters with the highest amount of satellites. So essentially, that has the highest probability of being picked at random. So th that's what we went with for the baseline. So what we see is that although the absolute uh, accuracy is not too high, it's much more than the baseline. And one thing we have to note here is that we were only training this model on publicly available data. So we have no idea about the load on the satellites or their performances or uh, or how many, how many uh, user terminals they're serving. We just know about these publicly available data sets, and this is the amount of learning that we were able to do about above the baseline. And then we also looked at some important features. So uh, the machine learning model seems to be very sensitive for uh, uh, standard deviation of two in the angle of elevation part, which kind of suggests that uh, the global scheduler is very sensitive to satellites which are higher up in the sky. So whenever they're available, it will probably go for it. And then uh, the second cluster essentially shows satellites which are much newer and which are also sunlit. So essentially, uh, the global scheduler prefers satellites which are new and which are currently being charged by the sun. So essentially, uh, in this talk, we perform high fidelity RTT measurements to identify evidence for the presence of a non-satellite uh, medium access control scheduler. Not talked about this a bunch in the talk, but uh, we have a lot of details in the paper. Then we develop a novel methodology to identify the current satellite the user terminal is connected to, and we uncover the behavior of Starlink's uh, global scheduler. So all of our data and our code is available on this QR code. Uh, so please go ahead and scan if and if it doesn't work, please let me know. But yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Hi, uh, Nitin there from Technical University of Munich. Great talk, by the way. Uh, so I have a two-part question, actually. So one is that uh, your 15 seconds global scheduler, it's a, it's a good find, an interesting find, and we also see it in our experiments. But I wanted to understand the contrary viewpoint. So if you block the view of your satellite dish within a 15 seconds interval, will it not get the connection until the end of that 15 second period because that would kind of hint that you have a fixed selection of a satellite for that entire period mm. so did you try something like that yeah so and this, okay yeah should i answer it first yeah, yeah sure please okay. go ahead. yeah that's a pretty good question so what we observed was that sometimes within a given 15 second slot we observed that the trajectories changed so we were we also did some where we were taking these obstruction maps at a much more fine-grained uh level so essentially every second so we observed that the trajectory sometimes changed within. So essentially, I think this user terminal kind of tracks another satellite in addition to the one that it's currently connected to. So if there is a major obstruction or something during that 15 second slot, it just changes to the other one. So we did see sometimes the trajectory, it changes to another satellite. What do you mean by trajectory change? Sorry? What do you mean by trajectory change? Tra trajectory of what? The satellites so it, or? So the obstruction image. So if you see a line for a trajectory, oh, okay. it just changes to something else, which, okay. which says that it connected to some other satellite. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, then my second question is, okay, so your most of the analysis is considering the user point of view, right? So you're looking yes. into the obstruction map of your satellite image. Uh, did you consider the uh, the routing behind the scenes and uh, how for example inter-satellite link selections of the path mm -hmm. that would have influenced your satellite selections that the uh, user would have gotten to you so was that something that you also considered in the study so we did not consider it for this dog but this is an important point that you bring up but i think we need a more kind of uh, elaborate experimental setup to kind of figure that out but that's something that we're doing in the in the current work okay that's Perfect. pretty good yeah, thank you so much so uh, that was a fun talk. Um, so thank you. Have you been able to um, make any conclusions about whether the scheduler is global in nature or whether the scheduler is actually a, um, a the natural termination of a of a lot of independent um, scheduling processes? So. So is 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 it a distributed scheduler or uh, with with, yeah. with with some. Mm. time time synchronization or, yeah. or or is it actually local because that would then be an interesting commentary on the failure modes so uh what we identified was so what this what the decision that happens at every 15 second interval is you have these user terminals and you have a bunch of satellites available so there's some sort of like a remapping between the two so user terminal to satellite i mean it could still be the same satellite but the remapping still happens and this happens everywhere at the exact same time. So essentially that kind of tells us that there's some sort of global synchronization that is happening at these exact sorts. For the local uh, scheduling, we see some evidence of uh, a medium access control scheduler on these satellites. So you get a bunch of a bunch of traffic from a lot of these user terminals. And how do you schedule that traffic? So we've not gone deep into that, but we talk a bit about it in the paper as well. But what we consider was that as a local kind of scheduler for the traffic, but the global scheduler is mostly just concerned with uh, mapping user terminals to the satellites. So nothing not to do with the traffic itself. So that's kind of what we how we understand it currently. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm presenting our work on dissected performance of satellite network operators, or what we call SNOs. And this is a joint work with Telefonica, Nokia Bell Labs, and the University of, of Surrey. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe before we start, um, let me give you a little bit of sort of an overview of the satellite connectivity, like the big picture. Um, starting with like where these satellite locations are. We've already seen from Hamas talk that uh, at least one part of the of the satellite story. Here we're starting with what we call a geo satellite, which is sort of one of the oldest types of satellites that exist. Um, it's somewhere around 35,000 kilometers um, um, in orbit. Um, and then we have what we call a MEO, a Middle Earth uh, a satellite, which is somewhere between 2,000 and the 35,000 kilometers away. And finally, we have uh, LEO satellites. Uh, which what we saw, for example, Starlink is one of uh, these satellites that are very close uh, to to, uh, to Earth. Um, and then part of the story as well is that you have the user with their uh, satellite dish that connects to these satellites. 
And on the other hand, you have the ground station and what uh, we call the POP, or the point of presence, which is really the connectivity of Starlink to the backbone internet. Um, and satellites is not new. They existed since the 70s, uh, but in the recent years, at least in the last three, four years, there has been um, a huge increase in the number of uh, satellites, uh, specifically when uh, sort of companies like uh, Starlink sort of started launching their LEO orbit satellites. And hence you can actually see all the light green uh, sort of LEO increases of, of the number of satellites um, in the last couple of years. Um, what you can see from the picture over there is that of course LEO has a much sort of limited uh, uh, coverage on Earth compared to both MEO and, and GEO. And hence that's why sort of uh, companies like Starlink has like a mesh of many satellites so that they can sort of provide a global coverage at any point in time. Um, now, we wanted to study the satellite performance and we wanted sort of to do something different, relying on opportunistic sort of uh, measurement uh, thinking rather than sort of using vantage points, uh, which could be limited in space and time that they're like, because these things are very expensive and you're going to end up in basically only a couple of small locations with a very uh, limited uh, short time span. We wanted to sort of uh, uh, break this up and get sort of uh, a much larger coverage that spans the the entire globe, as well as getting like sort of a, a good longitudinal sort of study over time and see how these uh, satellite uh, performance varies over over time. Um, and so for the how is we wanted to identify these satellite network operators using public measurement data sets that are publicly available on the internet. And two of the biggest ones that uh, stands today are uh, Measurement Lab, MLab, and RIVE Atlas. So these uh, have been uh, there for quite some time, and there's like uh, millions of records and experiments uh, that are publicly available. Of course, not all of them are on satellite. So the challenge was how do we identify basically from all these data sets, which ones are satellite network operators, so that then you can actually look at the performance. Um, and in addition to this, we wanted to amend this um, into also getting sort of uh, measurements from uh, higher layer levels and application level performance, because a lot of these public data sets are having sort of low, lower uh, layer uh, things like pings or uh, uh, round trip time and uh, downlink time, uh, like downlink and uplink rates. And they do not necessarily show sort of uh, application layer performance. So we, for that, we relied on crowdsourcing platforms and identifying users that are on satellites. And then we sort of worked with them in uh, measuring some application layer performance. So the main challenge, as I said, is how do we correctly identify which of these records that are publicly available are on satellite and how do I identify the users that are on cloud sourcing platforms? How are they also on, on satellite to be able to get like sort of a realistic uh, and accurate uh, measurement studies? So starting with the, with the satellites itself and the methodology that we have identifying um, these satellites, we started with the MLAB data sets. For those of you who have not seen MLAB, they use something called uh, DNT. Um, so it's a diagnostic network and tools that measure a lot of things like RTT, down, uh, uplink and downlink rates, jitter, delivery rates. And um, all of these data is publicly available on big, uh, Google BigQuery. So you can at any moment in time pull all of these measurement data from around the world and then you can analyze uh, them. And that's kind of what we started with. Uh, so we wanted first to start doing something called ASN to SNO mapping. So trying to identify which of the ASN numbers sort of belongs to satellite, satellite network operators as a filtering technique to all the records that we get from NLAB. And we relied on two different data sets. One is called um, ASDB, which was a paper at IMC in 2021. Um, they had about 100,000 sort of entries on uh, uh, ASNs uh, um, and ASN numbers that sort of map them to organizations as well as like the category that they work on. Um, and then we also looked into Hurricane Electric the BGP tool to sort of amend this with additional ASN numbers that belongs to satellite. And from these two sort of databases, we got about um, 164 different ASNs that were all flagged at least to have something to do with satellites. Then we manually sort of went over each one of them, uh, checking whether they really sort of uh, um, do uh, satellite network, uh, they are satellite network operators. And that process sort of cuts our ASNs uh, in almost in half. Uh, 
So we ended up with only 67 ASNs because the others were something related to either uh, sort of a cable TV or a terrestrial broadband connectivity and other sort of companies or enterprises that are not necessarily doing uh, SNOs. And then out of these 67 ASNs, we looked into the MLAB uh, data to see how many records come from these ASNs. Um, and that ended up having about 41 different SNOs on the MLAB data with about 22 uh, or 21.3 million records in total spanning slightly above uh, two years time span from January 21 all the way to April uh, 23. Uh, now the question is how reliable are these 21 million records that we've identified? Can we really uh, sort of validate that they are all coming from SNOs? And that's kind of basically the step that we uh, wanted to do next. So we wanted to do SN SNO validation. And what we relied on is the latency data that are reported by the MLAB, uh, basically trying to do sort of kernel density estimation to see the distribution of the of the delays um, for each of these ASNs. Um, and as you can see, for example, in the case of Starlink, there were two ASNs uh, numbers that were sort of uh, belonging to Starlink, uh, the 14953 and the 27277. And as you can see, one of them is not really a satellite network uh, ASN, but it was mainly more for the Starlink corporate terrestrial connection. Uh, which is the green one over there, whereas on the other hand, uh, the Leo sort of ASN is visible in the in the blue part. So that was like an easy way to sort of filter out all these like corporate uh, sort of uh, ASNs that really does not belong to the SNO. Um, next, we see two other companies, uh, one Web and O3B. These are two different other satellite operators. One works in in Leo, uh, one uh, Web. Uh, with a sort of latency slightly above 100 millisecond RTT. Um, and then uh, O3B is a MEO satellite operators with a latency on average uh, around above the 200 uh, millisecond. And those, again, were easy to identify uh, these ASNs. But then at the same time, we had cases where we had either a hybrid or a mixed scenario, where in the case of the ACS on the left, you can actually see the same thing. There's a clear corporate ASN that needs to be filtered out, but also for the ASN that uh, sort of belongs to the satellite uh, network, you have sort of bimodal uh, distribution here because uh, SES operates both in MEO and GEO, and they use the same ASN for both um, of these networks. Um, in the case of Tel uh, Alaska, they actually have a mixed sort of approach that even some of their terrestrial sort of uh, data goes over the same ASN, and there's no way of actually telling which of the traffic belongs to the terrestrial and which of the traffic belongs to the um, the actual SNO it's, itself. So that kind of uh, left us out into that the SNO validation, at least with sort of uh, the ASN numbers, works in, in some of the cases, but in some of the other cases, we need fil further filtering to inner satellite links being used like going to a ground station that was close to that pop or was it a terrestrial network connected it, to a close it's, it's mainly the terrestrial part okay. I, I think yeah uh because like as in the case of alaska and and others like it's it's really the terrestrial part that plays a role like where where does the ground station sort of connect to which pop that kind of is the one that plays the biggest role thanks uh, thank you for the very interesting talk yes sir so um I think one of the uh, plots that you showed uh, showed that the RTT kind of went down after a newer uh, ground station was added, uh, pop was added, sorry. But there was there was a case where it actually went up, and I think uh, mm -hmm. the previous question also mentioned about some ISLs. But if it's not ISLs, do you have insights into why they would change it to some some place where it would just go up? I'm I'm not yeah I mean this is a this is a good question I'm not actually sure why uh, it could be related to load issues mm -hmm. uh, that maybe some of these pops get sort of congested and they try to divert to the next nearest sort of pop selection because from what I've known at least like one pop serves about ten different ground stations in general so it could be the case that there were more ground stations added and some of them had to be shifted or due to load that they do these changes. In the case of Nevada, the change was sort of temporary. It was only oh. over a couple of, like a month or two, and then eventually it switched back. Okay. So and that could maybe tell something that yeah. it might be related to some load issues. Okay. And were you able to kind of draw out some uh, connections made over ISLs from the MLAB measurements? Like somehow just looking at their RTTs and because they behave weirdly when you compare to others, maybe you could maybe draw out if they were over ISLs or not. 
Uh, no, we we did not. But okay. that could be definitely something very interesting to yeah. look at. I mean, the data is like very yeah. sort of uh, dense, and I think there's a lot of analysis that could be done uh, right. additionally Thank you. in there. Thanks. Hi, uh, Nitinder here from Tech University. Mm -hmm. Great talk, yeah, sir. Uh, so uh, my first question is: Is that picking up on the last one? Your RIP Atlas analysis showed that your terrestrial part has a huge influence on the last link, right? Uh, but I wanted to get a clarification for your M lab. You were only looking end-to-end -end latency, so from your probe to your M lab server, and you did not look into anything in the middle. No. And well, how did that influence? So you have no idea for non-Starlink. Uh, right. What is the influence of the terrestrial? Uh, we, we, no, unfortunately, we do not for the MLAB data. For the RIPE data, because we have also trace routes, that kind of allows us to sort of dissect. Okay. Uh, any reason why you didn't look into the reverse trace route data from MLAB? Sorry, could you repeat the question? The reverse trace route data, because MLAB also does reverse trace routes to these probes when you are doing the DLT tests. So you can actually look into the reverse trace routes and see mm -hmm. uh, if it it won't go to your your last IP, of course, the probe IP, but it will be get terminated to the pop at least. So you can see what is the influence of the terrestrial last mile. Yeah, uh, yeah this is it, it probably is something to look to look into. I I think if I remember correctly, we were sort of starting to look into like many of these things, but it's not easy to analyze some of these data um, and okay. a lot of these things also because of any casts that is used over there right. it kind of complicates things right into like figuring exactly where the locations are okay uh, sure, and sure. then uh, i think we need to move on to Can you yeah just a comment please? that uh, your philippines thing that you showed here that's also resolved in august so now philippines also has a pop oh so. great <laughs> that's good to hear thanks for the introduction I'm Noah. I'm going to talk about measuring performance of the cloud edge and its effect on the digital divide. And this is work that I did uh, with my advisor, Cloud at Tufts University. So many applications are enabled um, by low latency. Um, and one that uh, one example that you're probably all familiar with is there have been lots of studies by large companies like Amazon showing that reducing latency increases revenue. Uh, but additionally, there have been uh, new emerging applications like AR and VR that require low latency, uh, like latency has to be less than 20 milliseconds to avoid getting motion sickness for these applications. Uh, additionally, there are there are even newer applications like um, machine learning at the edge. Uh, that is, the lower the latency gets, the larger uh, model you can use and enables like more accurate uh, applications. So really, this is an example where there isn't just a fixed threshold that you have to meet, but any reduction in latency makes your application work even better. All these applications, uh, or many of them are enabled by or uses the cloud, and they get low latency based on their proximity to the cloud. So the closer they are to the cloud, the lower latency that they can these applications can get. Um, so in a typical setup, you know you could have users like one hundred kilometers for from a data center in this example, or you could have users a thousand kilometers from a data center, right? So the users who are much further are likely to have a lot lower latency than the users who are close. So this sort of creates a divide between people who are you know, luckily enough to live near a data center and people who are very far. And um, so the dig digital divide has already been studied and, and shown that, you know, it can impact availability and quality of internet access. Like some people might not have as many um, internet service providers or might not have any. Um, and we're measuring this new aspect that we call the cloud digital divide, where we're looking at how this distance to the data center can affect this digital divide landscape. So we do that um, using a few different data sets that we combine, like um, active network measurements on RIPE Atlas, as well as things like economic indicators um, through like census data and population counts of areas. So this is a map showing the AWS data center locations in 2019. So every dot is a data center location. And then this is it in 2023. So it's changed a lot. There are many new locations. Those green triangles were all added. Uh, a lot of these are local zones, um, which is AWS moving the data centers closer to the edge of their network, um, being able to get close to more users can enable these applications. Um, so obviously with something like changing this quickly and enabling a lot of these important new applications, uh, we wanted to study it a little bit more and, and answer a few questions about it. So our, our first question is, how much of an impact do these new data centers actually have on latency? And second is uh, we want to look at if this expansion is fair or if it's worsening this cloud digital divide and you know giving some people lower latency than others. And last, we want to look at how per, uh, existing proposed digital digital divide solutions like the low Earth orbit satellites that we've already heard about 
um, how these can affect the cloud digital divide. So what we find is that there are large reductions in latency overall um, with the cloud edge, nearly 60% um, in some areas. And then we also find that this um, that the inequality is actually rising due to an in increasing gap in minimum data center distance between those who are closest and furthest from a data center. Uh, but there's also less unfairness. So the unfairness is decreasing and improving as the cloud edge is expanding. And last, we see that with um, low Earth orbit satellites that you know can uh, address the digital divide also can help improve the cloud digital divide and lower inequality and unfairness. So we'll go over each of these and we'll start um, with the measurements of cloud edge locations using RIPE Atlas. Uh, so our basic setup, our methodology is we measure the round trip time to the edge of three major cloud providers using about 5,000 RIPE Atlas probes. And our targets for these probes are IPs that were uh, provided by these cloud providers routing optimization services, which is like an Anycast service. Uh, so it's designed to get your requests to enter their private network as quickly as possible so we can measure the time that it takes just to get to their closest edge and we compare this to the round trip times from vms launched in each of the cloud providers regions so 100 in total and we do this to like answer this question of what if analysis of what if cloud providers offered compute at all of their edge locations so that's why we're measuring the cloud edge from these anycast services this is like if it was expanded even further than the picture that I showed earlier to all of their edge locations. And so what we see is that in North America, Europe and Oceania, uh, the cloud edge can be reached in under 20 milliseconds for more than 80% of our probes. Um, in the figure here, it's a CDF with the minimum round trip time that the probes measured on the X axis and the percentage of probes that could reach that round trip time on the Y axis. Uh, the solid line is looking at our baseline. So just the uh, VMs and cloud regions and the dashed line is looking at the edge. Uh, so you can see how before there was this, um, there was a latency that was greater than 20 milliseconds. But there. Before the latency uh, was greater than 20 milliseconds for 80% of probes, but um, after using the cloud edge, it was it was less than 20 milliseconds. Okay. So then adding in Oceana here, uh, we see similar to North America, but actually even larger improvements. Um, and a lot of this was because the baseline had no data center in New Zealand, but the cloud edge does. Um, and a lot of the probes are in New Zealand, so that's where we're able to see this even larger improvement from Oceana. But the main takeaway here is that the Cloud Edge does make this emerging low latency task, the tasks requiring less than 20 milliseconds, feasible on these continents with well-provisioned infrastructure. Um, but in contrast to that, we can look at the results in uh, under-provisioned continents. So um, in these cases, there's a higher absolute improvement in terms of the absolute latency but it's still a lot slower than we saw on other continents. So the x-axis here is three times longer than it was in the previous slide. Otherwise, it's the same CDF. This is showing South America. Um, and the median is still under this 20 millisecond threshold, uh, but the PAD is much higher than we saw on the other continents. We can also add in Africa here um, to the same plot, and we see that it, it sort of has a bimodal distribution. We see that over 60% of, of probes have latency over 40 milliseconds. Uh, and this is something that we'll return to when we talk about the digital divide and how there are like these large groups that have uh, much higher latency than others. But the key takeaway here is that there are still large improvements in these other continents, uh, but not enough to broadly support these less than 20 millisecond applications. So there are some additional results that we have in the paper that I'll just briefly go over. Uh, we show the details of like the medians and the PAD for all these continents. We also look at using the using the launched AWS local zones in the US uh, to compare to just the regions in the US and find large improvements in that case as well. Um, and we look at attributing how much of this edge latency is within the AWS network, um, which you know should be small if we're looking at the true edge. And we find that it is small for most of the probes, uh, but in particular um, in Asia, actually in the Philippines also, where we saw the, the Starlink issue in the last talk, that's where we see that like there's still some time being spent uh, within uh, the AWS network, even when we're targeting the edge, so it indicates like it might still be being deployed there. So now we'll look at like how um, this, uh, how these edge locations affect the digital divide, and we do this uh, with two different perspectives, starting with inequality, and this is looking at uh, quantifying the difference in minimum latency that users can expect, and second we look at unfairness, and this connects like some economic indicators to these data center distances, so things like. Uh, census income data connected to the data center uh, distance. 
So we define inequality similar to how you might define income inequality. We look at the gap between those closest and furthest from a data center, similar to how you might look at the gap between like, you know, the highest and the lowest income. And this is just a toy example to explain what we're doing. Um, in an, the initial uh, graph on the left, uh, we place a data center on the East Coast and the West Coast of the US, and we see that latency is low for those people that are close to the data center, but people in the middle of the country have the highest distance to the data center. If you were to add a new data center also on the West Coast, uh, you would increase the inequality because you'd be reducing the latency for the people who already had relatively low and not changing it very much at all for the people who had the highest latencies. If instead you placed a new one in the in the center of the country, you would be decreasing it for the people with the higher latency, and that would lead to lower inequality. So we quantify this as the P90 distance to the data center divided by the P10. Um, so that's like if 90% of users had distance of 100 kilometers to a data center and 10% of users had distance 10 kilometers, you know, it'd be 100 divided by 10. So what we find using uh, this metric is that there's increasing inequality in the US um, as these local zones launch. We use census data uh, for the population in each census tract. And this plot is showing the uh, number of local zones launched on the x-axis and on the y-axis what our inequality measurement is. We see that like for most of them, uh, for most locals on launch, it's increasing. There are a few that we've annotated there where it's actually decreasing, but the overall trend is that the inequality is rising. And we do the same thing at a global level, but in this case, we can't use the census data for the uh, population, but we segment the world into these administrative boundaries and use uh, global population rasters to see how many people are in each of these areas. And we find that in the uh, same graph just showing for North America, as new data centers launch, that the inequality is overall increasing. You can see that slight drop um, at the most recent launch. That was the first uh, data center added in Mexico that slightly decreased the North America inequality. Uh, we can add in a few other lines here also showing uh, South America and Oceania also increasing. So the same basic trend. Um, and even if we add in every continent, we see there's not quite as much of a change, but overall they're all increasing. Uh, so the key takeaway is that inequality is increasing with the expansion of the cloud edge and widens this digital divide that we're measuring. So next we wanted to look at unfairness. Um, and we start just with the general unfairness definition um, that you might see, which is like measuring the relation between socioeconomic and a health factor. And what this, uh, an example of like how this might be applied is access to nearby healthcare facilities and how maybe people with higher income might have uh, greater access to a nearby healthcare facility. So we're gonna do the data center analogy of that. And uh, we look at that with concentration curves. Uh, so what these do is they plot the cumulative percentage of a health metric against the percent of population ranked by income. So they look like this. Um, on the x-axis, you have the percentage of the population. On the y-axis, you have this health metric. If it was completely equal, you'd have this straight line, the line of, of equality. And unfairness that favors the wealthier population is this curve that's under the line of equality. That's because the population is ordered um, by their income. And so the people with the highest income on the right side of the graph have a higher percentage of the health metric. That's this unfairness. So we uh, define our analogy for the health metric as cloud access indicator. That's our unfairness metric. And it, we define it as just the sum of the data center locations that are reachable in a particular place. So a reachable data center, we say, is a data center with a distance less than a certain threshold. Uh, which we set to 88 kilometers and more details uh, on that are in the paper but it's basically you know a distance that's close enough that you could have these very low latencies that the local zones are trying to let you have and that would enable these new applications and we also uh, determine the concentration index which is just twice the area between the uh, curve and the line of uh, equality that we saw on the previous slide and that's just to give us like a uh, you know, a single number to measure the unfairness rather than just looking at these plots. And you multiply by two to make it so that the complete unfairness would be a value of one. So we look at this starting in the US and we get income data from the US census. And we see that the unfairness decreases compared to using um, just regions. So in this plot, like the, the faint green line going across is the line of equality. And you can see the blue line is the, uh, the concentration curve for regions with um, concentration index value of about 0.4. And when you include local zones, that drops to 0.2, so it becomes more fair. Uh, but we actually find that uh, a lot of the reason that it gets more fair is some of the highest income cities were near the initial uh, location of regions. So like when you add in new local zones, uh, you sort of, in many cases, you have to pick uh, 
lower income areas because all the higher income areas were already close to a data center. So that's one of the reasons that we find it decreasing there. And so next we wanted to do this at a global uh, global level. Um, but we have this problem of how to represent the economic status at a global level. We can't just use the census data that we were previously using. And to do that, we use remotely sensed nighttime lights. So this is like satellite pictures of the world at night and how much light is being emitted from different areas. And that's been shown previously to be a, a proxy for like the economic status of an area. And we find uh, many declines overall. Like this is showing the same, um, you know, it's kind of graph um, as we saw before with um, uh, inequality, but for unfairness, showing that the concentration index is decreasing as new data centers are launched. This is in Europe. Um, we add in two other continents here, like Asia and Africa. You also see these declines um, in unfairness. Uh, so that's different than we saw with inequality, where it increased for for every continent. However, there are still like some continents where it's increasing here, like for North America and South America. We we saw some increases. And the other thing that was interesting about this is the continents with the higher latency also had the highest unfairness. So those basically the top three lines on the graph there, that's Africa, um, Asia, and South America. They were the ones that had the latency that was uh, too large to fit on the first plot, and we needed the larger x-axis. They also have the highest unfairness, um, all above 0 0.6. So in the paper, we also have some additional results about this. We look at the P80 over P20 um, inequality instead of just the P90 over P10, and we see the same trends, increases on every continent. Um, we also look at the inequality for the announced data center locations, but the ones that haven't been launched and aren't available to use yet, and we see same trends. Uh, we also look at a hypothetical deployment. If you had put data center locations in the lowest income cities, and we see that it would decrease the unfairness um, further than what we've seen with the actual launch. And we look at a way to select optimal cities that would cover the most number of users, the largest amount of population being close to data centers, while also providing the lowest um, unfairness, increasing fairness. OK, so now that we have an idea of what the cloud digital divide looks like um, with these edge locations, we wanted to look at how using satellite internet could potentially affect this. So just a brief overview, we've seen this in the previous two talks, the idea of these satellite um, networks is that users connect to a satellite, which connects to a ground station, and the ground station connects over the terrestrial network to a data center. And these have, you know, can be used to provide internet access to people who don't have any way to connect to a data center over the, the ground network. And it improves the digital divide because many of these people otherwise wouldn't have an internet service provider, like in rural or disconnected areas, and they can use satellite instead. So we first wanted to look at how using um, satellite networks affect the latency that we measured with RIPE Atlas. So we again use RIPE Atlas and we measured the total round trip time um, using Traceroute uh, to both regions, cloud and the cloud edge, and the amount of time that was spent just in the satellite hop. And so we got results like this. It's the same CDF that we've seen previously with the minimum round trip time on the x-axis and the percentage of probes on the y-axis. And we saw that when measuring um, the latency to a cloud region, it was, again, much higher than the amount of time to the cloud edge. Um, but also the amount of time to the cloud edge was mostly just the amount of time um, within the satellite network and much lower overall than the amount of time spent in the regions. Uh, we still saw, though, that the P80 latency was above this 20 millisecond threshold. So even in the best case with the minimum round trip time that these probes measured, there, there uh, wasn't as low latency as we saw uh, previously, but it is expected to decrease further, you know, as, as the um, Starlink network gets better. So hopeful that this could be able to support some of the emerging applications. Um, so then we look at how this affects the cloud digital divide that we've been measuring, and we find that because the satellites can cover a wide area, you know, about 900 kilometers, um, that users can actually be further uh, from the data centers and still, you know, reach a low latency, potentially fast enough for these emerging applications. So it, it lets us adjust this threshold that we had set previously to be much higher. And with the higher threshold, the unfairness drops significantly uh, to under 0.2 um, in a lot in the scenario that we measured with Starlink. So it did significantly decrease the unfairness. We also find that there's a relatively um, homogenous time in the satellite hop. So different users connecting to satellite networks all see you know, about the same amount of latency when they're looking at the edge network rather than the regions. So our, um, our you know, idea based on that was that that should decrease the inequality uh, because everyone sees a similar latency. And so we simulated that 
and saw that the inequality falls to less than 10 on all continents uh, when using our satellite network simulator to measure the round trip time. And I think even more important than that is that the inequality decreases when adding the edge locations instead of before where we saw the inequality increase on every continent. Here we actually see um, you know, on every continent when you are able to use the edge locations, uh, the inequality is, is actually lower. So in the future, we want to look at multi-cloud fairness. This was all, all the uh, fairness related part of this work was looking at the AWS data center locations. Um, I think there are also other considerations that you can look at um, other than just the distance of the data center, like the cost of using those data centers. Some of these are much more expensive than others. Um, the environmental impact of different ones and data sovereignty laws that might prevent people from using certain data centers, as well as uh, what network infrastructure is available to connect to those data centers. Uh, I think there are also lots of limitations of satellite networks um, that we haven't considered yet that I think would impact what the digital divide looks like. So. Just in conclusion, the cloud can greatly uh, reduce latency and, and enable a lot of these emerging applications, but the benefit isn't equally distributed and creates this cloud digital divide that we measured, and the divide affects areas of lower wealth, but we've seen that this uh, amount of unfairness is actually improving. I just wanted to, to thank uh, the networking lab at Tufts and also just mention that you can you know, get the code at that link or, this, uh, or scan the QR code to get it uh, to reproduce all of our results if you're interested. So, great, thanks. thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I think we may have to limit the number of questions, though. So, uh, just if we can ask one short question each, maybe. And the uh, next, I, okay. So I'll, I'll make mine very quick. Um, did you? This was really lots and lots of angles to this, and I really like that. Um, did you uh, look at any of the? Um, uh, the uh, network censorship locally, as a as a um, as part of this, you know. So when you talk about the fairness of access, unfairness of access, you're talking basically using this RTT proxy. Yeah. But um, did um, uh, do you have any insight for um, the local uh, political uh, censorship and so on, or have you just presumed all access to AWS is is equivalent? Yeah. So for this work, we've we've assumed that all access is equivalent, but that's definitely one of the things that we've wanted to look at. You know, I think there are things like like just laws that prevent using other data centers, like you know maybe like GDPR like regulations. But then there are also cases where like maybe uh, you know countries are not that friendly and they don't want you to use a data center in another country, even if it's closest. So I think those are all interesting areas for future work. Work. Yeah, thanks much. A very cool and inspiring talk uh, and paper. Uh, I have a well, whenever you you do these measurements, and we are we are guilty of the same. You end up doing mostly pings, yeah. more or less, for RTT, which gives you the the super optimal, non-loaded. Uh, nobody is using the network; it's empty. You don't shovel 400 kilobytes, three thirty times per second to some edge device in order to get. So, with these Starlink optimize. Uh, Evaluation. You did simulation, so you would have actually have the opportunity to uh, look at load and load inflicted. Um, I don't know capacity limitations and 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 so have have you have you taken any have you had any chance to look into these aspects on how far these optimistic projections can actually carry in reality? Yeah. So we use this um, Hypatia simulator, and the the details of that are are on the GitHub link if you're interested and. Um, from what I could tell, that simulator does not take these into account. And in fact, it might be more optimistic than you get with ping because it's basically just taking into account the distance to the closest satellite. Um, so our simulation didn't take that into account, but you know, we know that there are definitely issues with this on Starlink. And I think more and more users have been reporting congestion and things like that. Right. Um, so I think that's definitely like when I mentioned that like limitations of satellite networks for future work, that was kind of exactly what we were thinking about. So I suppose that holds finally for the terrestrial networks as well, but for the start for, for the satellites, it's maybe easier to evaluate with a simulator. I think that's a great point. Okay. Anyway, it would be great effort to to look to look into this. Probably there's more people here interested in that kind of a, a direction on how to yeah. measure these things uh, under, under under load, under pressure. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the introduction and the work that I'm presenting today is a work by my students, Salsa and Elzar, that unfortunately didn't get the visa to come here. So I'm um, going to talk about a completely different frontier now. I'm going to talk about net zero. And uh, 
while uh, we are all uh, talking about the sustainability of hyperscalers and network providers don't consume as much energy as uh, hyperscalers, we have a lot more ISPs around the world and the carbon emissions of the network is not negligible at all. The numbers vary. If you're interested, you can read all about it in the paper. But today I'm going to focus on routing and on the scope to emissions of the network. And while previous work has looked at uh, power efficiency, carbon efficiency is a new optimization problem. So if we look at uh, the routers that we have here on the board, they are all the same, and I want to route from A to E. Power efficiency-wise, the best route to take is ABE. However, if I add the geographical dimension to the routing and I consider the source of the power for each of the routers, then router B is powered by a fossil fuel energy source, whereas C and D are powered by green energy, and therefore it would be better to go from A to E through C and D. And the opportunity that is new here is that actually carbon intensity became a predictable element per region that previously we didn't have. And specifically, the goal of this research was to quantify what are the potential benefits of adding carbon awareness to routing. And you should already know by now that we can't improve what we don't measure. But how do we measure carbon emissions? Carbon emissions relate uh, to several factors. One of them is the amount of energy that is consumed. Another is the source of the energy. And the source of the energy has a weighted carbon emissions that are associated with the source. And these two elements can are being called in this uh, talk carbon intensity. So when I'm talking about carbon intensity, that's the amount of uh, carbon emissions that is associated with an energy source. So I'm going to talk about these two aspects, energy consumption and carbon intensity, and I'm starting with the power consumption that over time becomes the energy consumption. And then power consumption of a router has two components. There is the idle power or the zero power, and there's the dynamic power of a router. And the dynamic power of a router, based on previous works as well as measurements that we have done, grows more or less linearly with uh, the traffic through a device, but uh, the idle power is a st has a static contribution element such as uh, the power supplies, fans, public cards, management cards, and so on. And it has an additional component, uh, which is incremental, which is the power per port. The carbon intensity, which is measured in grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, varies over time. Our uh, energy market today is a very dynamic and complex market. We are not being, uh, we don't receive energy from a single source. It's not like it's entirely green or it's entirely coal based most of the time. It, there is a mix of sources. And what you can see here in the graph is over 28 hours, how the carbon intensity in the UK varies in different uh, seasons of the year. And you can see that there are significant differences in carbon intensity, both between the seasons and between nighttime and daytime and so on. Because especially in the UK, we are not only using solar power for uh, green energy. We also have energy from wind, from uh, nuclear energy and so on. So we look at this carbon intensity and we consider the fact that actually it can be forecasted a day or two in advance. So let's see how we measure uh, the carbon emissions of a, a network, of routing through a network. We need metrics for that. And we are looking at two types of metrics, energy-related metrics and carbon-related metrics. Under energy-related metrics, we consider the typical power of a router. That's uh, the power at 50% utilization. It's a datasheet number. We also consider energy rating. 
like your air conditioner or a fridge has energy rating, we suggest to have energy rating also for routers. Uh, the detailed proposal is in the paper, but the idea is that based on uh, the energy consumption of a router, it gets a rating. And we also consider the incremental dynamic power, and this incremental dynamic power is per unit of traffic, so how many watts per megabit per second does your uh, router consume? In terms of carbon-related uh, metrics, we are looking at the carbon intensity that I already mentioned, and carbon emissions. Now, obviously, I can't see the future. I don't know what will be the future carbon emissions, but I can look on a previous observation period, and I can see what were the carbon emissions over the last 30 minutes or over the last hour, and use that for my prediction. Now, one thing to note, while carbon intensity is dynamic, we are looking at time periods of 15 minutes, 30 minutes. We're not talking about changing routing every few seconds. We are also looking at the combination of different metrics. So, for example, combining uh, the incremental dynamic power of a router with the current carbon intensity. And our approach is to look at the network and calculate for different metrics that we apply as link costs, what would be the most carbon efficient way to route through the network. And we can use different uh, metrics. For example, we can use the carbon intensity and look what will be the overall carbon emissions based on given carbon intensity. So for example, in this example, you can see that routing from A to F will have a, diff a similar cost from a through B, C, and D, and from A through G and H, and we actually in our uh, work apply ECMP, so routing can go through multiple routes. We compare that to other metrics, so once we looked at one set of metrics, we are also looking on other set of metrics, changing link cost and calculating again the carbon emissions. So, so far, just sending the listing cost affected only the dynamic power of a router. So just because I don't route through a router doesn't mean that it consumes less power because the idle power is still there. What I try, we try to do now is to further reduce the power consumption of a router by also powering down ports. And we don't power down any port. We are picking links that have least utilization and high carbon emissions. And we make sure also that the graph is still connected and redundancy is maintained. And the, the work is simulation based. We are using NS3. We are looking at two topologies. Uh, one of them is a British ISP called British Telecom. They are the largest ISP in the UK and uh, also quoted this paper. And uh, we look at the backbone uh, network, which has over a thousand <coughs> nodes, more or less the point where NS3 started to choke. And we also look at the network of Giant. We consider two traffic patterns. So if you look on the graph on the right, it shows the normalized traffic pattern for BT. You can see that during working hours, 9 to 5, the traffic is uh, mostly constant uh, in its any to any, so business traffic, whereas during evening time, it's mostly uh, residential customer traffic, and it's dominantly 90% uh, streaming videos. And what you can see in the graph on the left, which is uh, the BT network topology, the blue nodes in the middle are metro nodes, and actually there BT has caches. So video streaming is mostly coming from the caches that are in the metro <coughs> nodes. And what are our results? First of all, in terms of carbon and energy in the BT network, if we are looking on the graph on the left, which shows the day traffic, when we consider only energy saving, there are relatively small savings of less than two and a half percent. If we are looking at carbon-based savings, you can see that we can get slightly better 
uh, savings, but interestingly, being more carbon efficient doesn't mean being more energy efficient. So in some cases, we see that we consume more energy while we reduce the carbon emissions. And in this case, uh, the best metric is uh, using carbon intensity combined with the incremental dynamic power through the router. The best approach is a CATA or traffic engineering algorithm that turns off ports. So obviously if we turn off and reduce the static power of the routers, we can do even better. And we managed to save close to 50% of 15% uh, of carbon emissions. Uh, the cost of that in terms of latency is about 5% past stretch on the average. As far as evening traffic goes, well, that's a bit sad. We can't save a lot. And the reason that we can't save a lot is that there are very short routes between the caches and the customers. So we can't optimize the routing. Simply there are not enough hops. In Giant, in Giant, all the routers have the same energy parameters. So we compare the carbon-based parameters. And again, Kate, our traffic engineering solution provides the highest savings. And we do that with about 8% of the links disabled. Here, the latency is almost not affected by the carbon aware routing. Now let's look on a different presentation of the results. We are looking at flow intensity. How much traffic goes through a certain region? And what you see on the left is uh, the carbon intensity of different regions in the UK. And if a region uses mostly green energy, then it's green. If it is less energy efficient, it, less carbon efficient, then it becomes brown. And on the right, you can see a, a comparison between OSPF and carbon aware routing, the amount of traffic in different regions. So if we look, for example, on the Northwest England and East England that are relatively green, you can see that the amount of traffic using OSPF, which is in yellow, becomes red when we move to carbon aware routing, meaning that we move more of the traffic to run through the greener regions of the UK. On the other hand, if we look on East Midlands and South England that are less green, you can see that the amount of traffic through them decreases. So we move from yellow to green, which means that the amount of traffic is reduced. And then we get to London. And London is London. All traffic goes to London. A lot of traffic goes out of London. You can't avoid oh, London. And consequently, we can't avoid routing through it. So we see here, we see it also in Giant, that some places are a bottleneck. You can't avoid routing through them, even if the carbon intensity there is high. Similarly, for Giant, we are looking at the routing through different <coughs> countries. And you can see for France and Italy that have relatively uh, low carbon intensity, they are greener countries, that the amount of traffic through these countries when we compare OSPF and Kate increases. So we route more through the green countries. And if you look at Germany, then there again, it's a red country. We want to reduce the amount of traffic there, and we do, but it's a bottleneck. So if you look at uh, the giant topology, there are three nodes in uh, Germany, and you can't avoid routing through Germany. So again, we have a bottleneck where we can't uh, significantly improve the, uh, the routing. Last, we consider the ratio of static and dynamic power in a router. One of the big debates is actually how much does the power of a router change where there's traffic through it? And that's a property of the architecture of a router. So chassis-based routers have a high static power consumption uh, because of the, again, fabric cards, management card, all the components that are part of the router, whereas if you pick a pizza box, it will have a much high, lower ratio of static to dynamic 
a power. And we do a sensitivity testing, and what we find is that there is a diminishing value in carbon aware routing as the ratio of static to dynamic power increases. So we need to invest more in reducing the static power consumption of routers. In summary, carbon intensity and incremental dynamic power are the best combination of metrics if what we want to do is to move to carbon aware routing. Note that for that, you don't need to change your router, you don't need to change your infrastructure, you just take into account what is already there and the carbon intensity of your region. Second, energy labels that we suggested, they are good for purchasing. You'll have routers that consume less uh, energy. That's good, but it doesn't help us when we move to carbon aware routing. It doesn't provide a benefit of awareness. Third, the high idle power limits our carbon savings. We need to reduce it. Routing bottlenecks, again, limit our carbon savings, but we can't skip London. I guess that we can't skip Paris either. And carbon optimization is application specific. So whether your application is any to any routing or video streaming or live events like the Olympics or possibly gaming, you need to do different optimization in order to reduce the carbon emissions of your network. So our artifact is available and you are welcome to use it. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Well, uh, well I'm just moving around. Can we, uh, I have a question. It seems like you need to consider the carbon consumption of the caches in, in this picture, since you're effectively, they're an alternative to uh, routing through the network. So I don't know whether you have information on that or comments. We are doing follow-up work when we are looking also more on caches, okay. uh, but uh, specifically here we looked just on okay. that thing, because even if it's not caches, we assume that there's a server on the other hand that provides the video. Right. Okay. Yeah, caches affect the server, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yes? speaking i can probably hear you I, uh so great talk by the way uh, and great work so uh one question i wanted to ask is that how would you incorporate potentially the embodied costs of car of uh, carbon emissions of these routers within this uh, overall optimization as well so specifically uh, as i mentioned in the last slide we are looking at an equipment that is already there and asking what can we do now now obviously there's the question, what can I gain by replacing by my equipment with more power efficient equipment, but right. there is an embodied carbon. Right. No. That, that's not something that we considered in this world. Yeah, I mean, but you had the uh, the British Telecom work here because they have a control of the entire network. And uh, this is something that you can also give a recommendation to these uh, telecom operators that, OK, operational cost, I can see that you are reducing it by 8 to 10 percent. But if you also consider, for example, embodied costs, uh, what kind of savings are we looking at? Oh, sorry, uh, carbon savings are we looking at there? So we looked just on the scope too in this walk. So okay. that, that was there from the first slide. Other questions? Um, so I have a question. Um, in, uh, right here, Noah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, very nice, fresh look at the problem. Green look, so I like that. Uh, so but by pushing flows to the greener regions, are you maybe having a side effect of decreasing the resilience of the whole network? That's one part. Second part is maybe some of the greener sources which have daily variations such as solar, you could maybe add batteries and things like that. How feasible is that to do at the data center? Okay, so, so there are two questions here. First of all, uh, when we worked on it, we um, we had a lot of discussions with BT about resilience and how they balance the network. So we have taken that into consideration in different places. For sure, there is redundancy when we are looking at the topology. 
and we also look at the different levels of utilization. But at the end of the day, what we are looking here is on the optimal case. Is there any benefit in adding uh, the carbon intensity or the carbon awareness to our routing? Uh, as to our second question, we try to put in the same room multiple uh, power and grid people and ask them about, uh, you know, how do you account for carbon intensity? There are 10 different versions. Uh, one of the reasons is that there's a claim that if you have your own green energy source, by the fact that you are not taking from the network, you are reducing the load there, you are increasing uh, the marginal carbon intensity, and therefore, indirectly, you are affecting the carbon intensity and your source needs to be taken into account. So it's a very long discussion that is somewhat out of scope here. Specifically, the numbers that we are using are the carbon intensity numbers, you know, the official carbon intensity numbers for the UK. Thanks. Okay, my, my question is uh, how you calculate the carbon em emission is decreased mathematically. Can, can you please repeat that? I didn't hear the question, the beginning. Yeah, I, I'm saying that how you calculate the carbon emission is decreased from top to bottom from uh, power plants to the routers because distance also matter. Uh, what type of power plant it is and what type of? For example, the coal power plant uh, emit, emit more carbon and a less energy and a hydropower plant has a, doesn't emit a carbon. So how you calculate it all? Carbon intensity, it's not a number that- No, no, how you calculate it, carbon emission to make it net zero. Because every region has a different dynamics. Every region has a different dynamic? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Oh, uh, simple is the how you calculate the carbon emission is decreased mathematically. Ah, uh, the carbon emissions are uh, multiplications of the carbon intensity and the power consumption, basically, over time. So and we are looking at different power points in time, and we are looking, and we have a power model for each of the routers that we've been looking at, which are uh, specifically the ones that we were used here were the Arista routers where there are specific numbers that are reported uh, basically based on the model that you see. Well, actually we don't have it here, but uh, the model where you have this idle power that is known and then the linear increase with the dynamic power. Okay, one more question. Hey, uh, nice work. This is more of a clarification question is, what is a green source of power in your study? Because there are some countries which are pushing nuclear as carbon zero. Or... So each country is different and uh, it's clear also when we were looking at, uh, at uh, Giant because on Giant uh, it, the energy source was per country. So we were looking at the carbon energy source per country and you've seen you know, the significant differences between Germany especially since we were looking at the time where there was the energy crisis there. And if you are looking at Italy, that had a lot more uh, solar energy and it varies between the countries, but each country reports it now, it's uh, carbon intensity based on the, its sources. So it's not a discrete number. That's an important part. You have multiple power plants that are connected to the grid and each of them may be of a different type and it varies over time. No, we are not asking if it's green or not. We are looking at the carbon intensity, which is the gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So, so I don't I, know the exact number, but it, it... I think we probably want to take this offline because we're we're uh, getting late here. Um, it's yeah. just more of a curiosity. Thanks, Noah. So obviously you have most, most of the routers are basically local ones, right? And you can't really remove them because they serve the users. And I was wondering, did you look at kind of the, you know, what is the amount of energy that is actually consumed kind of closer to the user and how much is actually consumed in the metro core areas where actually you do the routing? So we looked at the backbone. We didn't look uh, closer to the user, which is open reach and not BT. Okay. Okay, let's thank, the, thank you very much. all the speakers. Thank you.